So first off, welcome everyone. Um, very pleased to welcome you all to um, our first uh, speaker of our Critical Development Studies Seminar Series this semester. This will be the first of uh, three speakers, um, all of whom are doing really, really fascinating uh, work in very different contexts. Um, and so our first speaker is Kareem Rabi, who I will introduce now. Um, so he's an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Illinois, Chicago. His work focuses on privatization, urban development, and the state building project in the West Bank, and is the author of Palestine is Throwing a Party and the Whole World is Invited, Capital and State Building in the West Bank, which came out last summer from Duke University Press. And can I just say, what a fabulous title, um, and a really, really interesting book also. Um, so previously, he was assistant assistant professor of anthropology at American University in DC, a Harper Schmidt fellow at the University of Chicago, and a Marie Curie fellow slash senior researcher at the University of Oxford Center on Migration Policy and Society. Um, he spent uh, this past year on research leave supported by the ACLS, the, the Wondergren Foundation, and the Graham Foundation for Advancement in Fine Arts, and was a visiting fellow at CUNY's Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, and Committee on Globalization and Social Change. Um, so with that introduction, Kareem, please take it away. Uh, thank you so much. Um, David, I the audio was kind of garbled, so I don't know if it's on your end or on my end. If it's on my end, uh, send me a chat or stop me and I will figure out if I can fix it. Um, okay, first of all, thanks so much. Thanks to everybody for coming to the department. Thank you, Jenny, to the department and to uh, to David for inviting me and to David, Marvy, Jenny and Kelly for organizing. Um, I'm excited to be here. So today I will talk for 40 or 45 minutes. I will draw on material that comes from my recent book, which is called Palestine is Throwing a Party and the Whole World is Invited, which oh, you can't see it. It's here in my hand, um, which was published about six months ago by Duke. Um, I'll tell you about some major changes in contemporary Palestine and their consequences for the future there. So the West Bank today bears little resemblance to the Palestine of rural smallholders at the turn of the century, of armed resistance in the 60s and 70s, or of the intifadas of the 90s and 2000s. Now, despite being under military occupation, surrounded by checkpoints and settlements, and subject to military incursion, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank is today building a state in and through private development and neoliberal practice. The putative state is almost entirely dependent on international financial aid and political support, and it increasingly and officially emphasizes private investment and privatization as a form of public service. At the scale of the state, the Palestinian Authority is working to build stable markets and institutions in an environment of, pervers of pervasive scarcity, of land, mobility, and sovereignty. Paradoxically, as I will argue, they are also redistributing insecurity downwards. So what does it mean to construct a state in this context, a state that may never truly emerge? This state is coming into existence already geographically truncated and politically hamstrung. And it's formed in terms of the increasingly overlapping imperatives of capital accumulation and development aid. <clears throat> now, asking these questions at all contradicts one of the main approaches to Palestine in the literature, which is, I think, presuming the occupation as given and identifiable and analyzing it through the binary of dominance and resistance. And within that sort of framework, private development projects may seem ancillary or somehow irrelevant to the big picture. But if the goal is to understand politics, aspiration, and political identities in Palestine today, it seems vital to look beyond local and narrow conditions towards wider political economic connections. So I'm motivated to try to understand the geographical scales of stability and what certain Palestinians are doing to cultivate stability and consistency. So broader, more general political economic links develop through the peace process. As that process fell apart, market building and capital accumulation emerged from the wreckage within the landscape of occupation and in synergy with it. Given this particularly unstable context, little could emerge but a neoliberal economy based on the free movement of capital, but not requiring the free movement of goods or people. I argue that this Palestinian state is not a negation of the occupation, but a redistribution of its effects. So today, in this neoliberal, neoliberal-ish period, the dynamic and productive processes in the West Bank can help us understand how it might be possible to construct a state as a particular social and geographical scale within which market relations can be organized. 
In Palestine, it's a scale that does not depend on clearly defined national boundaries. The Palestinian state is a hybrid of government, aid conditions, and private initiatives. So I contend that the case of the Palestinian state allows us to theorize neoliberalism in a concrete way. If, neoliberals, if neoliberal governance is often the thing left over after state functions are rolled back, what does it mean to produce it from scratch? So this non-sovereign state reveals something I think more general. Here, as everywhere, capital imperatives are fundamental to the logic of state formation, and neoliberal, neoliberal Palestine is no different. So mine is an anthropology of the state, of urbanism, and of political economy. I was trained as a cultural, a cultural anthropologist and human geographer, and I draw on both traditions in my method. And so one of the things that means to me is that studying phenomenon uh, requires starting with something tangible, in this case, a specific project to build housing. So I conducted research uh, at different times between 2008 and 2017, and I focused on one place where the dynamics of state formation and neoliberal development can be uncovered. That place is Rawabi, a massive new planned town under construction nine kilometers north of Ramallah and mostly funded by Qatar. The idea for Rawabi began to take shape in 2007 alongside the idea that Palestine had a housing deficit. Now, eventually, Rawabi is supposed to be home to 40,000 quote unquote middle class Palestinians. I interviewed dozens of developers, pro privatization NGOs, Palestinian Authority ministries, potential buyers, critics of such development projects, including some of those in settlements and ordinary Palestinians. Local, national, and regional are all tied together in this one place. Uh, but scales are abstract, malleable, and relational. And this, this case study makes it clear that we can't understand Palestine by looking at the local alone. Um, but it is also its ethnography that's enabled me to toggle between scales and to see how people shape and relate to wider ph phenomenon that bear on their lives. So today I want to tell just a piece of the story from the middle, from what Palestinians are doing to shape a Palestine subsumed within an occupation that is less cohesive and uniform than is often assumed. I'll describe how practices around an officially stated Palestinian authority national, pri national priority to develop affordable housing bring state politics and private development together in the landscape. Now, as the PA developed that priority, its practices bridged geographical scales and aggregated state authority and certain goals. As they remade governance, they established new markets in housing and finance, as well as new physical places. So my talk today is organized into four parts. First, I'll describe some of the aspects of the current spatial, political, and economic context in the West Bank, introduce the Rawabi, and discuss its relationship to neoliberalism. Second, I'll discuss the emergence of real estate development as a national priority and how developers create the illusion of need among a targeted population of home buyers. Third, I'll argue that ideas like this national priority are materialized through external state support of private development. In turn, such support shapes capacities in the emergent state. Finally, I'll describe some of the consequences of these social, political, and legal changes for the future of Palestine. So part one, the context for the levy. It's This housing development is one of the most striking, massive, and visible indications that Palestine is moving towards private development and governance. Now, well before there was any the levy to speak of, it had pierced the public imaginary and become a frequent topic of conversation. It's constantly in the local and international news, and everyone in the West Bank has an opinion about it. The highest levels of Palestinian and Israeli government continuously negotiate over its specifics, its road, its water hookup, and so on. The resources, the land, the political capital of marshals are unprecedented in Palestine, as are the changes it enables. So what had to happen to make Rawabi possible? Let me try to talk about it in terms of the push and pull between visions of the future and the present context. So in 2008, the first Palestine Investors Conference opened Bethlehem's $20 million convention center with a party to which the whole world was invited. The conference was designed to deepen the relationship between the government and private investors in implementing the 2008 to 2010 Palestinian Reform and Development Plan, the PRDP. I'll, uh, I'll return to that later. In 2009, December 2009, on a van ride between Ramallah and Bethlehem, I heard a call in radio show Listeners publicly greeted, congratulated, wished their friends and families well. And one man called about a friend's birthday and said he was from the city of Rawabi. Now construction would only begin months later. It was spoken of as a real place where somebody could be and could be from. And I mean, almost certainly this guy was uh, an employee of the firm. In 2010, by the time I made it to the second and last annual conference, two years after the first, 
massive development projects were planned, and Luwabi was the star alongside Tony Blair, former U.S. Senator and Peace Envoy George Mitchell, and then Prime Minister Saddam Fayyad. Speakers referenced difficulties and instability, but emphasized investment as a political, nationalist, and humanitarian responsibility. Now, one developer assured the assembled foreign and Palestinian capitalists that, quote, there are returns to be made here. And as one of few non-investors in the audience, I was surprised to hear the term return invoked in this register. Um, it was in English. Typically, when Palestinians refer to return, they mean the reversal of their exclusion from Palestine. They mean the return home from diaspora. So what's going on? Today, appearances and popular descriptions of growth, stability, and a functional open market often contradict realities on the ground in Palestine. But those ideas, and the practices that surround them go a long way in producing stability and future possibility. In the Middle East, that has recently seen widespread resistance to autocratic governments, as well as direct and proxy wars, or even armed gangs of civilians terrorizing neighboring cities and seizing property. Ramallah might be, in some ways, and for some people, one of the most stable places in the region. So let me tell you a little bit about how we got here on a more general level. West Bank Palestinians' relationship to Palestine substantially changed after the 1993 Oslo Accords, <clears throat> the ostensible end of the peace process. Arafat and the exiled leadership of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, returned from Tunis and elsewhere. In 1994, the Palestinian National Authority, the PA, formed for an interim term of five years, during which time negotiators would prepare for the day after occupation and iron out the final status issues, quote unquote, final status issues of borders, settlements, Jerusalem, and the right of return. Today, of course, the PA still exists. It is totally subordinate to Israel, and legally and practically speaking, there is little it can do autonomously, um, including, as, as we know, accommodate basic norms like elections. Final status issues are unresolved, and the official peace process is long dead. What happened, I argue, is that political and, and international actors uh, and returnee capitalists began to promote private investment as a means for political stabilization, and it was a process uh, from which they might also benefit. In 2007, Saddam Fayyad, formerly of the IMF, became Minister of Finance partially at the behest of donor countries. Later that year, at the time of the split between, between Fetah and Hamas, the Palestinian president appointed him prime minister. The split and Fayyad's ascendance were the basis for new kinds of pro-privatization initiatives in the West Bank. As prime minister, Fayyad focused on privatization and reform at the national scale. He established an economic agenda centered on the need for profit and worked towards a national economy that would encourage, st encourage stability, investment, and ultimately the state. Now, Thomas Friedman coined, uh, coined the term Fayyadism to describe it, but I think it's a mistake to give him all the credit or all the blame. Fayyad, that is. I think we can say whatever we want about Friedman. About Friedman. So first of all, Oslo created the idea of a Palestinian interim government operating with meaningful sovereignty, but at some later date. Second, it arranged the West Bank into three categories of territorial control. Area A, where Palestinians have civil and police authority. Area B is under Palestinian civil administration only. And the rest, more than 60% more than of the West Bank, is Area C, where, where the PA has no official presence. Now, C is land protected for Israeli settlement and a major reason why Palestinian areas are discontinuous. Um, so this is where Nawabi is located in terms of the area system. Uh, the sort of stratified bands uh, represent the categories of control. It's under Palestinian authority on a previously empty and unprofitable hill in A, surrounded by B or C. So you, we can see sort of the street plan and then the much larger um, sort of planning unit. These categories, of course, benefit Israel. Area A typically surrounds places that were already built up in the mid-1990s with B as a buffer. The categories are the more sweeping successors to the 1980s Israeli planning regime, the blue line plans uh, that, encir that encircled towns and cities and prevented natural growth, planning, or building beyond them. And although developers have had difficulties with the Israelis for an access road and for a water hookup, the placement and scale of Rawabi occurs within the regulations of occupation planning. So Nawabi grows from this landscape and becomes a part of it. And rather than open new land to Palestinians, Nawabi opens the existing land to new forms of intervention, appropriation, and ownership. And in the post-Oslo landscape prior to the day after occupation, the question is, how is it possible to build a profit-generating enterprise to benefit the Palestinian nation? So let me pause for a second. 
The areas under Palestinian administration are circumscribed by and almost entirely development dependent on foreign aid. The government knowingly and willingly accepts aid conditions in order to keep receiving it, in part because public revenues are in short supply. Development practices shift with the times towards privatization and away from the state, rendering the two increasingly indistinguishable. This means a reorientation from public works, municipal projects, cultural centers, stuff like that, towards private developers. Now, this has been described as the neoliberalization of Palestine, but I think it's more useful to refer to the contingent parts of neo neoliberal ideology or practice that I'm trying to describe. So neoliberalism, after all, is a form of capitalism. Capitalism is universalizing and has a universal imaginary. It unevenly develops territories and places in relation to one another, and it distributes difference and power. But it's not cohesive and it's never equalizing. Um, as Andy Clarno puts it, it's a context specific process of social and political economic change. Uh, this is how Jamie Peck puts all this. The tangled mass that is the modern, tangled mess, pardon me, that is the modern usage of neoliberalism may be telling us something about the tangled mess of neoliberalism itself. So it's better to parse than to lump. The scholarly literature on neoliberalism is huge, but here are a few aspects that are most relevant to my study and sort of by way of definition. First, that privatization is part of the continuous formation of the state, governance, and civil society relations, and that privatization is often a response to administrative and political problems. Second, neoliberal forms of capitalism extract labor value, but do not replenish social reproductive capacity, either through wages, types of infrastructure development, or state forms of aid such as healthcare. Third, the reproduction of labor power has cultural and social dimensions. And finally, the nation state, while it was never, never totally self-sustaining or bounded, is now almost entirely a node in a global political economy. So the point here is this. I emphasize the imperatives of capital accumulation that drive the state building process and marketization. It's piecemeal, it's not monolithic, it is in part spatial, and the ways that combinations of its attributes appear are not inevitable. It's a process of becoming. I want to try to mode to I want to try to understand the modes of exercise of power rather than its location, which is um, language I, I, I took from Janet Reitman. So the big picture in the West Bank, the fluid relationships that neoliberal capital and states have to territories and national markets are not fundamentally at odds with the present conditions of occupation. Moreover, state and economy building projects work to create stability at the scale of the national economy in the relationship with Israel but may distribute instability downwards socially. So how does one get from all that back down to the landscape? And how do ideas about the market inflect government practices? And how do those become material in housing development? How are ordinary people included and tied to what happens at more general scales? So part two, real estate as a national priority and the construction of need. Question here is, how did the focus on private development emerge locally and as a question of the state form and governance? What you see there is the uh, Palestinian Ministry of Planning's workshop to review the process of preparing the national plan for 2011 to 2013. Palestine, as you may know, is an alphabet soup of ministries, NGOs working in the public interest, NGOs working narrowly for private interests, international NGOs, and so on. And they constantly pr produce reports that make claims, report facts, and make arguments. There are endless meetings to discuss those documents. Sometimes it feels like everybody has a development project or is in some meeting. Now, I promise you, this is really the image of, of, a, lot of, of a lot of these politics in the West Bank today. Needless to say, the government can do almost nothing without Israeli approval. So it's easy to see this kind of thing as meaningless. And it is, of course, a completely different image of political life under occupation than rock throwing or checkpoints, uh, let alone of democratic participation. But this process imp is important because once the ideas uh, congeal at the government scale, um, they can be really meaningful for future orientations of Palestinian politics. So how does an abstract pri quote unquote priority to develop affordable housing emerge? The circulation of ideas and statistics and documents can help tell part of that story. On the government side, we first see that priority in the 2007 in response to its own lack of capacity and as, as an argument for large-scale real estate development. The PA elaborated its housing program in the 2008 to 2010 National Plan, the Palestinian Reform and Development Plan, and in subsequent plans and national program documents with names like Ending the Occupation, Establishing the State, Palestine Moving Forward and Home Stretch to Freedom, Establishing the State, Building Our Future, 
and state building to sovereignty. And a few years ago in an act that I think strengthens this point, the, the Ministry of Planning was mostly folded into the Ministry of Finance and the Office of the Prime Minister. The latter gave us the 17 to 22 national policy agenda of putting citizens first. So beyond these titles that, that, that really kind of toe the line between aspirational and delusional, the reports I think are productive. They represent, describe, and orient government reforms. They elaborate priorities and programs. They propose and create opportunities, mechanisms, and justification for aid and private sector responsibility. And they become the basis for the ideas and plans that follow. So now in parallel, on the private side, the pro-privatization NGO, the Portland Trust, and the Palestinian Investment Fund proposed large-scale development to work towards the government's priority. Those groups were then able to operationalize that priority and create vessels for large-scale investment from NGOs in the US and elsewhere and donor states like Qatar. The Portland Trust hired a New York-based architect to design what became the lobby. Now, despite being founded on external aid, the public and private sectors act as if they're operating in an open market uh, and work towards creating the Palestine in which they would like to intervene. So once real estate became a priority, and the state and international organizations needed to help developers overcome three problems. First, they had to demonstrate the existence of a housing shortage that developers could fill. Second, they had to make it possible for people to uh, afford to live in the apartments by creating new debt instruments. And third, they had to create clear legal claims to land so that it could be used as collateral for that debt. So if the priority is to support the nation, how are its members incorporated? And what is the actual demand for home ownership? Based on population growth, the Palestinian Investment Fund said there was a demand for about 146,000 units in 2008, a number they believed to be conservative at that time. They forecast a growing problem. Demand would reach nearly half a million units in the next decade. However, according to the Bureau of Statistics, that number is roughly the total number of households in the West Bank. So it seems as though the investment funds projections may be more reflective of the population that they wished to bring into market than of the existing social conditions. First, they counted the growth in individual nuclear families. Second, they assumed those families would need their own apartments. But many Palestinians live in large extended family houses or buildings. According to the Central Bureau of Statistics, in 2012, more than three quarters of Palestinians were living in homes that they or their families owned already. And these numbers also excluded refugee camps, uh, undercounting the number of existing units and overcounting the potential market by describing camps as unstable. And the, the, the camps are you know, much better understood as neighborhoods, they're not encampments. So in order to prioritize private development in the government and to bring both sides together, the numbers had to be reconciled. Uh, they came up with a pretty elegant solution to the problem, which is that they just got rid of the conflicted numbers. Uh, I have a few examples of statistics and preliminary ministerial reports that failed to make it up the chain and into plans at the national level. And their absence validates developers' own numbers and implies that the current conditions of extended family ownership need to be addressed through new housing. As national goals are reconceived as support for privatization at the state scale, there's pushback and skepticism at the more practical lower levels of government. So one member of the Higher Planning Council told me, quote, it is important for the private sector to eradicate accurate analysis. According to him, there may be a deficit, but it's nowhere near the number cited. He continued to say, uh, I can find a house in 24 hours if I need one. So how do these uh, West Bank numbers, so sorry, pardon me. He asked, do these West Bank numbers mean people will move to the Mullah rather than commute? Where will they come from? He notes that building patterns and land scarcity around the Mullah exist be because of and in response to the conditions of occupation and mobility restrictions. And I think what he's doing is he's implying a huge question, what national problems could this form of development solve? To him, they're political problems. I would also add that they are distribution problems. So how do Palestinians in the West Bank become potential buyers if they already have homes and if the need for affordable housing implies that most can't afford uh, what the existing market supplies? Various studies, including the Portland Trust, put the confluence of adequate supply and affordability for apartments at around $50,000 to $60,000 under normal lending conditions. 
Developers know what people can afford, but they also have to meet their own needs for profit and demand. To do so, they created mortgage financing. And given the political situation, they're able to insulate themselves with foreign aid. Affordable Mortgage and Loans, ML, uh, the acronym spells HOPE in Arabic, uh, were to be funded by international organizations, including in a $500 million project backed by the US government's Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPEC. So what's remarkable here, to, to me at least, is that the idea isn't to lower housing costs by moving the green band to the left, or I guess this is the left. Uh, instead, it's to raise the line. It's to make it possible for Palestinians to afford the new supply of apartments through debt. And I, I mean, we can see parallels like in higher education debt crisis in this country. So all of a sudden, based on these figures, 82% of the nearly 500,000 Palestinian households who are said to need homes require mortgages to afford them. Housing shortages might be matters of prioritization at the point of supply, but for the nation, demand for housing ought to be seen as a problem of distribution. And under this government priority, however, the housing supply by, by private developers first meets their own demands for financing. Uh, whatever they may be, Palestinians' needs for apartments, I think, are secondary here. Well, we've seen how the solution to housing problems became government support of real estate development. But developers' needs for rent and profit are rarely commensurable with general affordability. In practice, that's meant debt. So I think there are real potential consequences here. New forms of housing presuppose a market of buyers that can produce potentially new socialities of life and lifestyle. Housing is intimate. It touches most everyone's personal and family life. Um, now, I remember being, being surprised the first time a potential buyer told me that he looked forward to taking out a mortgage. He said that it gave him the opportunity to conceive of a new kind of living in a new timeline. And even though we were talking like, directly after the financial crisis, he nevertheless found the term of the loan enabled him to think about a future quite different from the presentist instability common among Palestinians. So more generally, what might it mean to base a stable political future on these in individual debt relations? So the state and private development. In Palestine as everywhere, developers alone are incapable of ensuring the kinds of consistency that, that a mortgage market requires. They need help. So what we see here is a, is a project of market stabilization within an unstable context. It is only secondarily said to be a project in support of general political and economic stability. Now, unlike mortgages under American Fordism post-World War II, these projects do not presuppose stable living wages or promote home ownership as a way to enable families to buy the goods that they produce. In an environment where there's little production at all, Palestinian families are targeted solely as consumers of debt and housing. This kind of lending is possible under neoliberal, neoliberal capitalism today, and little else is especially suited to the peculiar stateless West Bank context. So what does government support of lending look like? Banks in Palestine typically do not do much long-term lending. Political and economic instability makes them reluctant to tie up large chunks of capital and loans. Um, there, are, there are clear historical reasons. Pre-state Zionist militias self-funded through seizure and bank robbery, and Israel froze Palestinian accounts and appropriated assets on a huge scale in 1948. Uh, Palestinians subsequently sued Barclays and, and Ottoman banks in the early 1950s. Eventually, the banks reached a deal with Israel. In return for a large loan, the new state released only about half of what it had frozen. Um, uh, Srimati Mitter is the person who writes about that. Not to mention, Palestinians are reluctant to take on long-term debt for state for straightforward, everyday reasons related to occupation. The social preference is for saving in order to build on existing homes. Now, there's another instability that presents as a barrier to lending. Uh, land tenure is very complicated, and plots of land can be held collectively. Without clear title, land can't be used for collateral. But clear titling is difficult. PA law, Israeli civil or military law, Jordanian law from 67, or Ottoman law can govern what happens in certain places in the West Bank. And these bodies of law have been overlaid on these territories in an incomplete way. And the transition between them and the law of the putative state requires a kind of consolidation and translation. So it's through the prioritization of housing and private development that new bodies of law enter into the putative state. These laws enable capital accumulation, but do not strengthen government institutions, and this is another part of how the neoliberal state, a neoliberal state can emerge. What happened specifically in this case is that developers bought a patchwork of plots where they wanted to put the new town. 
Supposedly, they sent teens out into the diaspora to Jordan, Lebanon, Latin America, Dearborn, to track down families and individuals who, over, who owned that land. Now, this is an incomplete map, but I want you to get a sense for the large number of plots underneath the levee. Where land was registered, it's, it's outlined in purple. Uh, the rest is still privately owned, but registered under different property regimes. Now, using Ottoman law, the government then did a fairly large eminent domain uh, to tie together the site footprint, which is, again, the planning boundary, the sort of diamond peach shape thing. Uh, of the land with buildings on it, about 40% of the site's 200 acres were seized. Typically, eminent domain must meet the public good. And this is the first time the Palestinian government did it for a private entity. As a result, land on a large scale has clear title, apartments can be collateral, and a mortgage market can emerge. Now, as I understand it, the eminent domain happened using a rush provision in the Jordanian law. Basically, the Palestinian Land Authority set up a fund to pay out people who had their land seized and notified them. Uh, compensation was based on prices in the area pre-speculation and development, so owners had two choices. They could take the money or they could fight it. Either way, the land had been raised. Moreover, developers were granted around 1,500 acres, uh, 6,300 dunams, surrounding their plot, uh, where they control the planning and building approvals and will provide services. Now, as the government consolidates land, practical jurisdiction gives rise to laws. Uh, for example, there's a Dawabi bylaw outlining the rules in the planning area. I asked for it constantly, I never saw it, and when I, when I was last there a few years ago, it was still forthcoming. But I do know that it's been dictating how people in the area use their own land since at least 2010. Um, years ago, I went to look at a couple places where developers had invoked the bylaw, complained to the PA, who in turn stopped individuals from building their own homes. And there, there, I mean, there are almost certainly more examples since then. So here again, priorities laid out in, in service uh, of the nation inflect everyday life and change the way individuals hold and use their land. Moreover, it seems to me that the state has ceded its responsibilities for housing, instead working externally in a service role for developers. So what does this all mean for the relationship between public governance and private development? What does it mean for potential buyers and is it sustainable? So it's not totally settled, but a recent BBC documentary put the, apart, the average apartment costs in Jalabi at about $95,000 and they can cost more than twice that much. In that documentary, the reporter asked the head of the development firm, quote, if only the wealthy middle class, the wealthy middle class, can afford to live there. The developer replies that, quote, a young couple making a little bit higher than the minimum wage should be able to afford this. But recall the lower numbers from earlier. The reporter counters, nevertheless, there could be, quote, an ocean of resentment if it's not affordable. So what happens is the developer shifts the blame. He says, low income homes should be supported by the government usually. Unfortunately, we have not gotten any support, financial support from the government. He, question, he continues to question not only the PA's efficacy, but also its politics. Quote, I think the Palestinian Authority should have done this already and done more than this. And I'm not saying that they're useless, but I think they should have built more, especially around the settlements. I think there's a, there's a real question here, which is like, how could he expect otherwise? If this project is premised on the PA's lack of capacity under occupation, and it enables the PA to reconceive of the meaning of state responsibilities. So is this public-private partnership strained? What does this mean for Palestinians in the West Bank, especially those who might not be able to afford the housing on offer? What does it mean for the PA as a political institution? In that same documentary, the chief Palestinian negotiator with Israel said of the developer, those people who will make the investments with high risk are the ones who are going to take Palestinians toward investment and in an expeditious fashion. So I think that's the public-private partnership. Some summary. Given the character of the quasi-state in Palestine, aid is a necessary condition of governance. And as the state sheds its responsibilities and works towards privatization, development aid does too. Moreover, the state as aid recipient is crafting and supporting a market that is not open, but backed by financial capital that emerges out of donors and NGOs political capital. On that basis, the government, donors, and the private sector come together to create large-scale housing development that claims to prioritize and meet needs. Developments physically anchor political economic transformations, 
alter the landscape, and incorporate ordinary Palestinians into a wider vision for the future. New projects set, set precedents for future interventions and investment. More specifically, the government acts as a conduit for aid to reach the private sector and alters laws such as those regulating land tenure and tenants protection. Aid agencies and donors back development and finance projects in order to minimize risk for Palestinian investors. Quote unquote, middle-class Palestinians are entered into projects as consumers in new markets for housing. Markets that did not exist prior to large development and with forms of financing that could not exist prior to reforms in land tenure and foreclosure law. The Palestinian Authority, donor institutions, and Palestinian capitalists may have differences, but they share two goals in this case, to make Palestine stable and to make Palestine profitable. To achieve those goals, they come together to operationalize and produce an institution, the state in the West Bank, that does not fully exist. Now, the PA's lack of capacity is real and is exacerbated by the PA itself and the international community eroding its responsibilities, abilities, and funding, not to mention, of course, that it is under occupation. Part four, the consequences now and for the future. Pardon me. <clears throat> the state and the private sector are not diverging as much as forming in the image of one another. The Rawabi has already drawn resources away from surrounding villages. One person in the Ministry of Planning told me, why is it our responsibility to make private development attractive to buyers? Why, if there are public needs in areas that are already populated, he said. Now, in 2013, the PA made Rawabi an official municipality where developers can more directly receive government funding and have the capacity to tax. Also by 2013, the US Government Accountability Office more or less declared failure. No funds had been dispersed to buyers through the $500 million loan apparatus, and one of the main NGO partners, the Cooperative Housing Foundation, had by then been, been rebranded as Global Communities. So despite over a decade of work, um, only 710 people have moved in as of the last census. Um, most of them are renters who are also employees of the development firm. The place looks like a movie set. Um, instead of concentrating on filling apartments, developers prioritized opening their central upscale shopping mall and service economics over housing. In practice, this has meant incorporating Palestinians into this, this national initiative, not as 40,000 new homeowners, but as a small number of consumers. So uh, previously, I wanted to put up a screenshot um, of the, the, the Rawabi live cam, sort of showing, showing it at night, where you can see sort of what lights are on or, or not on. Um, but I, I only have one that was from four years ago. And when I went to update it, um, I found uh, the live cam seems to have been turned off. So instead, here are some from last year that I found online. You have Palestinian military intelligence, you have hashtag Burberry, hashtag Ibiza, and so on. So priorities that presuppose and ostensibly promote housing have effects far beyond individual homes and are productive of much wider social and political context. At the same time, all of a sudden, an open market and functioning state could look much smaller. So whether or not Rawabi succeeds or a territorial state emerges, this broad suite of changes to the economy, aid, and governance is happening. Um, and it includes aspects that could forever alter how Palestinians live in their homes and in their homeland. I want to reiterate how important it is that these, intervention, that these interventions are fixed in places. Um, again, housing is intimate. It brings families and everyday life into this wider vision. Uh, new places and forms of governance incorporate Palestinians. Politics form within and through them. And there is a visible movement away from the national political aspiration for a homeland to a more individualized economic aspiration for home ownership. Um, but I want to be clear that, that this is not, I, I, I don't think, an isolated phenomenon, um, but it's perhaps the clearest iteration of the trends and development logics that are crashing over Palestine today. So let me end with some brief examples of how other parts of Palestine are being opened up to market and how that process might relate to the conditions for life, social reproduction, and political imaginary for years to come. Here's one example. Um, the Palestinian Authority is the largest employer in the West Bank. It is scaffolded by uh, between one and $2 billion annually in international aid, and the PA employs 170,000 people. In 2014, a fifth of the jobs in the West Bank were in the private sector. Uh, the number is much higher in, in Lisbon. Public sector wages are the foundation for the West Bank economy. But Israel regularly and punitively holds Palestinian VAT revenues 
and the PA subsequently struggles to pay its employees. When that happens, sometimes the PA pays just a percentage of wages, sometimes it withholds them altogether. Workers in the public sector are having trouble getting paid enough to cover growing expenses, if they're paid at all. And they can't organize in response. For several years now, the PA has been in, at war with it, its public sector employees union and arrested its leadership, uh, presumably in retaliation for 2014 strike actions over the lack of pay increases in line with inflation. Uh, moreover, their numbers are shrinking. The PRDP capped the number of new public sector employees that could be hired. At the same time, the PA has also been directly deducting uh, loan payments from workers' paychecks. And this public-private form of loan servicing targets and punishes a shrinking and precarious workforce. And even if they're having trouble making ends meet, they have no choice but to see their wages garnished for loan payments. This is unlikely to help grow the Palestinian economy or foster economic independence, and it raises serious questions about the sustainability of wider practices. Here's another striking example. Historically, Palestinian judges side with tenants over landlords, given the histories and lived experiences of dispossession that they share. However, a forthcoming new law will deeply cur curtail judges' leeway, and it will make it easier for landlords to remove people from their homes for non-payment. Large-scale real estate developers and lenders aren't the only ones who benefit. So while much of Ramallah has seen a massive building boom, the old part of the city, Ramallah Tehta, uh, still has numerous low-rise old buildings. And many of those buildings house families who have been there since 1967 at adjusted 1967 rents. And so what happens is, is owners are now sitting on land worth previously unthinkable sums, millions of dollars, and, and the new law will make it much easier for them to, uh, to displace those tenants, empty the buildings, and develop land for profit. In the West Bank, laws, like everything from borders to paychecks, are often vague, non-existent, and malleable, but they reflect specific values and they can be invoked to regulate practice. Uh, these are laws uh, that, are, that are never completed and perpetually forthcoming. Uh, and like the bylaw, uh, the Rawabi bylaw, they do work despite their questionable existence. Now, in a strange twist, Israelis are often interested in Rawabi as a model for privatization. In an op-ed some years ago, the conservative Jerusalem Post argued it's an example of what Israel can achieve should it shake its burdensome socialist legacy. So this is what economic peace entails. Today, I've described some of the forms of neoliberal state formation in the West Bank through this one example of housing development. And looking at something discrete and tying it to the ways that ideas circulate uh, has, I hope, shed light on something bigger and not immediately obvious, which is the materialization of ideas and practices, coalitions, and physically in places and spaces. It's a cycle. Practices, people, and institutions then inform and are reflected in subsequent uh, iterations of coalitions and ideas. Um, and I think what I'm trying to do is to, is to understand Palestine as well as much wider conditions. Um, rather than the kind of rollback we typically associate with neoliberalism, the West Bank state is emerging here in this place, already dependent and truncated. With and without resistance, the private sector and pro-privatization pro NGOs reform government laws and generally establish an atmosphere friendly to investment. It's impossible to talk about the PA without talking about the private sector and international aid. Not only are their goals in concert, many of the leading practitioners alternate between jobs in the three sectors. And state skill governance is necessary for regulation to shape investment and for infrastructure to exist at all. It is also impossible to talk about the state without talking about its people. The relationships between investment and governance shape the state's capacities and produce space and context for social reproduction. So from the construction of, of of need, to a population of home buyers as an aggregate category of potential market participants, through statistics and reports, from forthcoming laws, order and practice in the present, we can see how structures at multiple scales come together and interpolate Palestinians by presupposing a future and building one from the present. So thank you so much for your time. I am looking forward to your questions. Great. Well, thank you so much for um, that really, really interesting presentation. Um, I know we all learned a lot. Um, um, so now, yeah, I think we can open up the floor to questions. Um, so either um, raise your hand, um, you can pop a question in the chat. Um, 
or uh, you can just talk. Yeah. I can just talk or questioners can just talk. Oh, sorry. Questioners can just talk. Um, I've done enough talk. And, um, yeah, and I would I would like to um, apologize for some of the messages in the chat. I think we were not really prepared for any Zoom bombing for this presentation. Um, so please disregard those. Um, um, I was wondering, um, you know, you had really stressed um, this relationship between um, the sort of emergent or forming Palestinian state through the PA and its relationship and funding to foreign aid. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit about um, the, the role of conditionality in foreign aid in structuring um, uh, the like types and focus of the housing projects that are happening. Um, and in particular, I was interested because you said that, what was it, only 710 people were actually um, like living here, but the focus was actually on the, um, on the like shopping and commercial spaces. Yeah, I think, I mean, first of all, that, that, I mean, that number is probably low now. I mean, it's, you know, it's coming from the Palestinian Bureau of Statistics, which is, you know, it's difficult enough to gather statistics in, in Palestine and everything, but that is what the census said. And, and I think that number is valuable because it, it shows the sort of like severe mismatch between the rhetoric of the place and what is actually going on. You know, the I'm going to answer your question by not answering at all. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, when I started going to, to, to Palestine and uh, for this research and, and doing this research, like the, the state building project was the thing. Uh, it was the thing that that um, that everybody was in the government was talking about, and it was the the sort of way that the the way that all these projects were being oriented. So, like the, we had state building and all these things kind of hanging off of it, and sort of oriented around it. Um, and I I remember talking to um, talking to people, and you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, my my mood is anecdotal for some reason. I don't know. But so like, you know, I was, I, I remember going to these, going to all these interviews and just being like the state, this and that and state theory and blah, blah, blah. And people were just like, what are you talking about? Like, there's, there's no state here. There's, you know, the state building project is bullshit, you know, things like that. I, that's a direct quote, um, you know, and so, and so it's, it, it, the question became like, well, so what is the state idea doing and what is the state building project doing? And one of the things that it's doing in this case, which I think it is, is coherent, but maybe not as strong in, in other contexts, is it is just sort of like reorienting aid to the private sector. So through the basically the, P, the PRDP sort of created a, a fund <clears throat> specifically that sort of takes all that funding, sticks in this fund, and then gets dispersed to the to the private sector. And so I, I in one section of um, of the book that I wrote when I was I was talking to to people in the surrounding villages and I went to uh, one of the community centers or like sort of municipal centers in this tiny tiny village like a thousand people live there something like that and um, and you know it's this big USA bill it has the plaque that says built by USAID and you know 25 years ago or something like that um, you know and there's like one road that goes to it that's that's sort of well paved. And it struck me that like the point that I'm trying to sort of push out about aid and the private sector is that the scale of this kind of investment, the scale of this project has really done a good job of reorienting that aid to the, to the private sector. Like you don't see big municipal projects like that anymore, you know? And so, um, so I, I guess, so part of it is just the honest, the, the, like me being honest that I, I didn't really trace out or can't really tell you very much about sort of specific forms of, of conditions that, that come with these aid, with these forms of aid, because it really does just sort of get, get dumped into a pot and then, and then distributed, distributed elsewhere. There are still are, you know, you know, small microcredit projects and, uh, you know, small, you know, uh, like uh, farming infrastructure and stuff like that. Th those projects still exist. 
but like this this scale of stuff that I'm talking about, I think is a little bit different. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, Jenny. Yeah, thanks, Kareem. This was super interesting. Um, this is not a part of the world that I know too much about, and this might be resonant in the question I'm about to ask. But um, I'm wondering, I guess, when you say that uh, you know you were ulti you were initially interested in the sort of state building project and sort of found that there was none to be had, right? It was like there was no there there. Um, do you feel like that? Does that then mean that uh, there's no sort of territoriality that's unfolding through? the construction that you're talking about um, and the sort of housing developments that you're talking about. And I mean, do they at all see it as a way to claim land or push back against, you know, potential or ongoing Israeli settlements? Like what's the sort of like broader, I guess, context um, in that respect? Yeah, um, I will, let me sort of rewind a second. Like, I don't think there's no there there. I think the, the 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 thing that I think is interesting, or the thing that I'm trying to explore, or the I mean the thing that I think is true, not just exploring it, is that the state building project is is like is producing um, relations and ideas and infrastructure and places and all this stuff. So like the 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 process and the project part of it, I think is very real. The the sort of like sovereign, independent, territorial state part, I think is probably not. Um, on the question of like the territory, yeah, you know, this is like, this is where I sort of put my urban geographer hat on and say like, I think that, I think that one of the reasons why this kind of a project is successfully doing this and successfully making these changes is precisely because it is like material, like ideas materialized and, you know, fixed, fixed places, forms of fixed capital and so on. So like, so, so that's, that's one, that's one part of it. The other thing is that the developers do talk about how it's about claiming land. They do talk about sort of like, um, yeah, claiming, how do you say it? Yeah, building on the land in ways that they're not typically allowed to, things like that. Um, in in parts of the, the longer project in, in the book that I wrote, um, I do talk about how like the guy in the in the investment conference talking about returns to be made there, like I think that this is one of the ways where they're sort of like they're reframing ideas of national politics using sort of rhetoric about land and land holding and sort of like appropriateness of Palestinian stewardship of the land and things like that, but transforming it into questions of their real estate development. So it is important. Um, yeah, it's important in lots of ways. I mean, I think it's it's important sort of in this kind of like political aspiration part in terms of the rhetoric that they're using successfully to sort of materialize it, uh, to materialize their project and also to sort of make it appealing to Palestinians. Um, I think it's important in sort of, like like the case of the potential buyer, the guy who's taking out the, um, taking out the loan. Like I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to take stuff like that really seriously because it was it was jarring to me to hear him say like I'm looking forward to taking on a 30 year mortgage because it allows me to think about 30 years in the future. And it you know and and that I mean that struck me you know as somebody like a student debt and you know who I doesn't who like doesn't come from money or whatever like that's that struck me as as um as really interesting but also you know like very real for 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 people like him to be able to say like this is enabling me to have a piece of Palestine this is enabling me to have a Palestinian place here um and the developers are are not only sort of saying that explicitly but uh using that to um using that to make the project appealing does that make sense I can jump in, David, if uh, Kareem. I, I really enjoyed that presentation, Kareem, and I'm sorry. you. I think you were speaking about these things. I was trying to deal with the Zoom bombing <laughs> outside my office. So you may have said something that I'm going to ask about, but I'm interested in the kind, and I, you know, it seems like your, your project was um, oriented more to the 
you know, maybe at a different uh, register than what I'm talking about. But I'm wondering about, you know, ideas about citizenship and, and um, the ways in which uh, people, I guess subjectivity is what I'm really interested in and the, the, the kinds of attachments that people, um, I, you know, I saw the pictures, the yellow car, the woman on the, on the balcony. Um, you know, what, um, in particularly in relation to the state, right? Um, you, you know, what is the, um, what are, what are people buying into, right? What do they think they're buying into? What are they becoming part of as they become part of these, of these new, new settlements? Um, you know, how do they talk about um, what they're doing, what they're becoming? I, you just talked about the guy who, bought, you know, who wanted to see himself 30 years into the future. But I wonder if you have more ethnography around that. Yeah, I mean, the... The first answer to your last part that is just me being totally honest is I don't have a ton about that because I was researching it sort of in the in the the process of its coming into being. You know, I did talk to some people who live there, uh, but that was not the major part of it. Uh, the major part of um, the project just because of timing and stuff like that. You know, if I was if I was gonna if I was gonna continue this project, which I am not. Um, then I would I would go live there, you know. I would try to live there um, if they would allow me. Uh, so I don't I don't really I don't really know about that in any sort of like satis satisfying way how to answer that question. Um, but I can say that I I think that talking to potential buyers did a lot like did a lot did did that kind of a, a work for me because what people are buying into I think is like. You know, like the guy who wanted to take out the loan or, or you know, I had, I had a bunch of interviews like this. I'll just sort of, I, I quoted from him and from, from this young woman at length, but I, you know, I, I had, I had interviews that sort of those, those two sort of represented the, this kind of thinking, which is that like people are exhausted. People are, you know, people are sort of like are tired by the, you know, the terrible conditions that they live in because of occupation, because of movement, because of, because of, you know, all these things. And, and this, this place has come along and presented itself, presented a vision to them of a form of aspiration that's class aspiration for sure, and ownership for sure, but of Palestine, you know, and they've like, and, and they, they, they find it convincing, you know, and I, and I wanted to, again, the reason I wanted to take those people seriously is because I, I mean, I think it's real. I think it's working for, for, working on lots of people. And also I don't think, like I want to be, I want to be careful to push back against, um, I mean, for people who are sort of familiar with this project, these kinds of like knee-jerk critiques of these people are bamboozled, these people are sort of losing their their, their Palestinian politics or whatever. Like I, I didn't think that was happening in that way. So I think that, yeah, the promise that this place is presenting is really appealing to people. And one of the things that I do talk about is I, I sort of contrast the material that I got from the potential buyers with um, with people in the surrounding villages who talk about the land and sort of you know, appropriateness and stewardship and sort of historical ties to the land and you know all the sort of like these these parts of the the national imagery and national imaginary like they talk about like the developers and the people in the villages talk about like olive trees and buildings and Palestinian vernacular and all these things they talk about them in the same ways. And, and so the thing, but the thing is they have different goals and different sort of like ultimate directions that they're, that they're taking that, um, that way of discussing these things. I sort of, I, I lost track of my sentence a little bit, but they're like, they're using the same, they're using the same kinds of ideas and kinds of languages for similar purposes, which is about like uh, to establishing the sort of the necessity and the appropriateness of land holding, but they're just doing it in two totally different ways, you know. So I, I do think that, like, yeah, the the I think it's very real to people to say like, this is a Palestinian thing of Palestine that looks a little bit different, but it's it's sort of it's it's um, no less Palestinian. And that's also just to sort of get back to the previous question, why I think why I think it has potential ramifications for like the sort of complicated relationship between class and national politics, 
because it's it's taking the sort of ideas about national politics and ideas about the sort of the Palestinian nation in Palestine and sort of transforming them into this different project and different process, I think. Um, so to jump directly on that question with a follow-up, if I if I understood you correctly, right, you were saying that um, this this shared um, that there's a shared idea of Palestinian residents tied to the land that's being drawn on for um, the like discourses around like protecting like olive trees and agrarian cultivation as with these um, like residential neighborhoods. Um, and could you maybe expand a little bit on the different directions you see in that, in the connections between those and the, and the differences in the comparison between that? Um, Cause, and I ask that because I am more, much more personally familiar with the, the literature on, on resistance in Palestine that's tied to agrarian dynamics specifically. I think that I think that the I think that the people who are sort of making arguments like the ones you're 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 talking about and the developers share assumptions about Palestine and about Palestinian land and the landscape. They talk about it in similar ways, but have just different sort of ideas of the of like what how to how do you say like how to sort of operationalize those politics, you know. I guess I, I I think that they're, you know, part of the part of the thing that I that I also do, which is not very relevant to your question, is I I think that like that kind of way of talking about the Palestine of the smallholders and stuff, like a, 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 absolves capitalists and sort of like neglects the sort of like the ways that ownership has been really important to, to, to holding land. Private ownership has been important to holding land in Palestine, things like that. And, and so, so one of the things that, I, that I, I do with that material, I think, and I hope, is to try to sort of like reintegrate sort of like a critical approach to, to capitalism and market logics and things like that into it. But I mean, I do, I do think that like, yeah, I mean, one person is saying like, this is like this is the pal like from the lobby you can see all the way to the sea some days you know the the people in the villages are saying like this is our sort of our beautiful um our beautiful natural landscape and they're both trying to do the same things in totally different ways and but yeah but i mean i i think that that's that's right because what it does it leads directly back to the previous question which is like yeah, there are different there are different sort of views of the, the 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 project of doing national politics or different practices around national politics, but but they share they have a lot in common, and I think that's one of the way one of the reasons why it is appealing to potential buyers. Maybe it's just a clearer way of putting what I was trying to swing around in before. I guess as a follow up to that, I'd be curious to ask um, whether there's a lot of aid money that is uh, bilaterally flowing into agrarian development projects as well. Or has that, in your view, do you think completely shifted into this kind of private development mode? Or is, are both sectors kind of going on side by side? Like if I think of um, in Pakistan, I see a lot of like USAID and World Bank will be doing a lot of work to build uh, private housing societies for the elite and there'll be all kinds of things going on. But at the same time, there will also be a lot of um, kind of smallholder agrarian development projects just because of the way their global portfolios are arranged. And I wonder if you see this kind of dichotomy or this, uh, this happening in Palestine or if there's any tension between the way donor money is allocated in these ways. I know you said it's centralized through the Palestinian um, authority, but is that is that is there a dynamic there? I mean, I don't. The 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 first thing to say is I don't know. I mean, I, I my my sense is that is that yeah through the um, through the sort of the 
the things that emerged from the PRDP, it was called, it's called the Municipal Development Lending Fund. That's the, the, the big fund that the, the, um, the PRDP created. The, the person I read about that is Adam Hanigia, um, who's, well, he was at SOAS, now he's else, well, Exeter, I don't know. Anyway, Adam, Adam is, is, um, is uh, very good on all these issues and somebody whose work is really important to me in this project. But yeah, but Adam, Adam sort of talks about the, that, that transition in aid um, I, much more clearly than I do, let's say. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that those projects do exist, but they're like, they're minimized because this sort of like different priority that has emerged to fund the private sector. And then also because, um, you know, the, they face so many problems. Right, like there's, you always hear about, um, you know, this like small sort of like agrarian development projects or whatever that are um, really targeted by the Israelis. So all the time you have, you know, cisterns that are destroyed or you know, uh, farming infrastructure that's destroyed, especially if it's an area C. And so I think that, I think that my get, my hunch, my hunch is that through the sort of like. Um, ideological process, ideological development or, or whatever that I'm talking about. And also the, like that is combined with the sort of the real difficulties of doing the, the, the kind of smaller projects. I mean, there's still, yeah, there's still those kinds of projects of agricultural development. There's still, you know, uh, food aid. There's still sort of refugee camp infrastructure. Um, but I think that this is the sort of, this is the direction that things are moving. And I think that like, I mean, you're identifying something that is, I think, I mean, like I stand by it. I think that, it, that I think that what I said was right, but also a problem in talking about something that's this huge is that like, I think the hugeness of this project of the housing development project is really important to making these changes and pushing precedent, you know, but it also sort of like in my mind and sort of analytically and in the research project has also kind of crowded out crowded out uh, the wider, that's just me being honest about being a researcher, you know, has sort of crowded out the, um, some of the, the other things. But no, those, those projects do exist. I mean, I was recently helping a, helping a friend write a project, well, I guess I can't, I guess I really probably shouldn't say it in the way that's recorded. I was, I was, I was helping a friend write a project about, um, about agricultural development projects. And I, and I know that, that these things, um, yeah, still exist, but also are are under threat in a different way. You know, so one of the you know the it's one of the things that they've tried to do in Area C specifically, try to aid Palestinians in Area C, um, and then but then that also puts them at much more at much greater risk. Right? I mean, the people in the projects, but the people in projects at at at. at um, well, not greater risk. They're already under risk. But the but the the it makes the um anyway, you understand. What's your next project? Uh <laughs> so um so like for the last 10 or 15 years, I'm I'm uh everybody in the West Bank has been talking about China. And there are sort of jokes about China and an imaginary of who's going and what they're doing there, and you know, everybody has a cousin or an uncle or a classmate that's supposedly opening up a factory and things like that. Um, I mean, what we know about the ways that uh, ownership pr production works, like it seems unlikely that that's what they're doing. But, um, but you know, so like you hear these stories about their streets and streets of Palestinians, things like that. And so I went twice in 2015 and 2017 between Palestine and China and then was going to be gone all of last year, much of last year. I was on I was on leave, which I of course couldn't really do much with. So I um, so I didn't travel. But that's my next project is 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 trying to do kind of an economic geography and ethnography of of that link. And one of the things that really struck me also is that you know people like me who who work on these topics or in this mode often we'll talk about um, things like the Paris Protocol, which is the economic part of the Oslo Accords, but without any real idea about what it means in practice. 
you know, you hear the stories about things that are being held at port and, and stuff like that. Um, but but I don't I, I don't I don't see and I don't really understand the, the, the sort of the specifics of it. And when I started to talk to these people, um, I sort of learned that the, the shippers and the importers and things like that are and people like that are the ones who really understand how this stuff works. And it sort of started to, to, to build for me an argument about how um, about sort of how how Israel is is sort of crafting the sort of suspended West Bank market. And so, so like I want to do the economic geography. I should have, I missed, I missed a, an important uh, detail, which is that a lot of the Palestinians who are living in China are there doing import export and um, and are sort of facilitating trade between between Palestine and China. So those those people like really kind of understand a lot of how that works. Um, and there's also these interesting diasporas. So unlike my family, which you know sort of went this direction. There, there are a lot of Palestinians there who went maybe to you know Lebanon or Syria and then to uh, maybe Eastern Europe and, and ended up in China. And there are these different generations of Palestinians in China. You know, there are people who went sort of out of third worldist ties and have been there for a long time. There are newer, newer young guys who are there around the embassy. And there are these people who are there as traders. So I, I think that yeah, I want to do a project on that. And I think that I can. You know, do an ethnography of this group that I think is 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 really interesting, and then also about the sort of wider political economy of 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 Palestine and 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 the market. So, like one of my one of my shorthands is sort of like, if this project is the the one that I talked about today, is about how capital comes in and is, and is fixed in Palestine and what what it's doing. The next one is sort of about who can move outwards and why. And so that's that's the the project I, I want to do. And I have yeah fun ideas for it. Like I'd, I'd like to import a container. I have some sort of uh, some ideas of of working with friends who are like a friend who's a filmmaker, a couple friends who are who are artists who do a lot of interesting stuff in Palestinian archives, things like that. So so yeah, so that's it's super that's, cool because I think we hear so little about people going to China. <laughs> Everything's about China. You know, Chinese people going, they're going out strategy, right? Investment around the world. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I hadn't even thought that people are going to China anymore. <laughs> it seems like well, I, I, almost I, I an old fashioned idea. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, the first, the first couple of times I went, I mean, the first time I went, I really was just like, okay, let's see if I can find these streets and streets of Palestinians. Let, let me see if I can find the place where I can, you know, eat this specific Palestinian delicacy or something like that, you know? And so I went and I asked around and, you know, I went to Beijing and they said, talk to this guy and this guy. And then they said, go to Iwu. So I went to Iwu, you know, and I, and I, um, and I, I, I started to sort of build up the picture of who they are and what they're doing. And I think it's really interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that project. Mm. Yeah, it sounds great. Thank you uh, for your talk. It was really interesting. Thank you. Where are we at on time? Are there more questions or what are we doing? People have yeah, I mean, drifted out. No, David, I'll leave it to you. Yeah. Um, well, if there aren't any more questions, um, I think that we can wrap up. Um, thank you again for your presentation. Um, it was really a pleasure to hear more about your research in a, in a more extended format. Um, um, and I am really looking forward to reading about your future research. Because um, actually, I've, I, I've heard in the course of my own field work about Moroccans who are going to China and critiques of the Moroccan government for not protecting Moroccan citizens in China from like labor violations and, and things of that nature. Um, they're, probably, um, they're probably going to the same places. And I mean, and that's one of the ways that the, um, that's one of the ways that the, the market is being suspended, right? Israel can let in, you know, lots of goods that could feasibly be be produced there, not other things, not raw materials. You know, like there's there's there are ways that through importation they can they can really sort of like maintain a lot of the characteristics of labor and and production there. You know, and, I'm, and so I'm I'm sure it's similar in Morocco. Yeah. 
Well, thank you again. Um, and for those of you who are still with us, I will just briefly um, pitch our, our next talk um, in this seminar series is uh, in two weeks um, with Martina Arboleda. Um, um, so if y'all have time, you should definitely attend that as well. Um, and thank you again. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kareem. Thank, thank you so much, Kareem. That was amazing.